and, and the one characteristic as we studied our 100th year and we talk a lot about our people is that every era in our 100 year history has had major challenges. You could go back decade after decade after decade and the one constant at Whirlpool, and I would argue many of the companies here in Michigan, is that we've all successfully adapted to change. We overcame whatever issues, whether they be economic trends, political trends, technology trends, or competitive trends, and we've adapted, adjusted, and continue to be successful. And that, that was probably the real inspiration, I think, uh, for us during our 100th year anniversary, uh, because it, it really gives us confidence that, you know, I don't care how old you are, I don't care how big you are, I don't care how successful you are, if you aren't continuously paranoid about somebody beating you today, then you're probably going to fall behind. And that's really the mindset that we, we try to create. The other thing, just in opening, I'd say someone, one of the fellows here on the panel talked about success many times comes through failure. Uh, and, and in the case of our company, that's absolutely true. Why are we in Benton Harbor, Michigan? Because that's where uh, three young individuals in 1911 formed the company. Two of them family members and one of them an outside investor. Their very first, it was built off of a, a patent, a patent for a washing machine, for a gear which automated a washing machine. That's all it was. The fellow who owned it took, took it to his uncle who had a machine shop, probably because of the auto industry, because there was a lot of machine shops in Benton Harbor. And he said, yeah, I can make that. And they made it and they wound up making a washing machine. And then they said, well, we gotta sell it. And they got their first order, 200 products, to a company called Federal, Federal Electric. In that first order, they shipped basically all their money they had in their life in outside investors was working capital, and they shipped that order. And a couple weeks later, they got, I don't know if it was a phone call or a telegraph or whatever, but uh, some of the products had failed. And there was a crack in this gear. And these three folks at the time decided that no matter what they did, they had to stand behind their product. And the customer was first, quality was important, and they went out and got, found somehow a little bit of money to recall all these products, fix them. And, 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 and the reason I bring that up is it, it was catastrophic, both the event and the problem but they took accountability, they stepped up, and they solved it. And, and since that day, quality and taking care of the customer has been a part of, of Whirlpool culture, literally from, from the first year of operation. So we've gone from that one product, one customer. When I started the company 30 years ago, 31 years ago, $2 billion business, uh, gigantic business, I thought then. 95% uh, of our business was in the US. Uh, as my predecessor, who was, was CEO for about 17 years, told me in the mid-80s, he said he, he counted, he thought 17 people at Whirlpool had passports then. 17. Uh, so since, the mid, since my, my start in 1981, we've gone from $2 billion to what we are today. And, and, and again, we believe we are in the appliance business, but it's all about, we, it's, we're a global business. We believe in great brands. We believe in great products. And at the end of the day, if we take care of people's lives, we sell them one at a time uh, in every home, everywhere, everyone around the world, that's the business we're in. And because of that, we've been able to grow to over almost $20 billion in revenues. We have 68,000 global employees, about 23,000 here in the U.S. You know, we've gone from 95% in one country in 1981 to 170 different countries with more, a little bit over 50% of our revenues outside the U.S. And we have six great global brands, all well over a uh, uh, billion dollars in revenue. Uh, but it's the spirit of winning and the spirit of waking up every day and knowing you've got to get better that I think pr propels the company. And well, first of all, we didn't like this line. This was the average trend of the 1990s of average dollar selling price per item which simply meant that if, if 1992 was 100, 
it went down on average 2.3% uh, a year, which means there was a mixing down or there was a price competition. And this was because what we ultimately believe was a lack of innovation in the industry, and we were susceptible to that. So we went back and looked at our fundamental strategy, which, which I would be honest, today still hasn't changed. It's, about, it's built around a strong global operating platform, a, a strong trade platform for the people who sell our products, but most of all along a strong consumer platform. Best brands, best loyalty, best, best brand equity. And we concluded then that what was missing is we did not have true innovation driving our, the brand portion of our strategy, and that, that we had to do something very different to do it. But we didn't know what to do. And so from there, both he and I spent a lot of time the next six months reading everything we could read, visiting companies who were allegedly innovative companies, uh, talking to a lot of people to try to figure out what did we need to do within our organization to put us on a different path. Uh, this is kind of, in short, kind of summarizes all the different things we looked at. And, and, and you can imagine 15 years ago, and there probably is today, there's many different opinions and theories on what innovation is. Some people think R&D is the only innovation there is. Some people, the, the one I really, a lot of people 15 years ago were talking about was the great man theory. And that theory went something like this. Innovation's hard. That not everybody can innovate, and you really just only need to take your smartest people and put them in a room and let them figure it out. That, that was a real belief 15 years ago. Well, we didn't know who the right 10 smart people were, so we, we figured that wasn't a very good approach for us. Uh, we also didn't believe that there's a lot of people that, talked about, you need to train your organization to be innovative. Well, that's interesting, but how are you going to train them to act differently? Skunk Works, very popular 10 or 15 years ago. That basically means you put special money aside, special people aside, and have, have them go work on just new ideas, generally tech, technology driven. We did that twice over a five-year period of time, spent tens of millions of dollars and got zero commercial products. So we didn't like that approach. R&D only. Uh, you know, our products have a lot of technology in them. Our products are driven by advancement in technology. Technology by itself and new technology by itself is not innovation. In our space, the application of technology to create a new consumer value could be innovation. So we didn't think it was just an R&D thing. We also tried, you know, and again, I know it sounds new, 10% of everybody's time to work on innovation. Well, if they didn't, you know, again, how are you going to train people to work on innovation if they don't know what it is? And by the way, if we haven't defined what it is, we had, you know, the best consulting minds in the world, and they all had a lot of good ideas, and they were all willing for, you know, a fee to come in and do a big project for us. That wasn't it. So as we step back from all this, uh, we concluded the following. Um, and, and, and this was what I would call the leadership moment, mostly driven by my, my predecessor, uh, was that you have to know who you are as a company. You have to be honest. You have to talk about how things get done and what you can sustain and what you can't sustain. So got, given all this knowledge that we developed around innovation, we concluded this. Uh, in our kind of company, it's either all in or none in. And so we had to make this prevalent across the organization where people really got it and that we made it part of what we do every day or we wouldn't do any. Because that's just how we know what we were good at. The second is we did bring in the best external thinking in the world, a lot of it, and we still do, by the way, because you never know where the great next great idea is going to come from. We ultimately had to turn these innovation tools into business tools. Uh, again, make it what we do every day. Uh, diversity, I mean, that, that was, you know, diversity not just in talent, but diversity of ideas. When we set up our, kicked off our first innovation teams, and we had many, many teams on looking through what we call many different lenses, uh, we made a 
strong effort that we, that we didn't want the same people say, thinking about the same thing. We put, as we call it, old people, old employees like me, with young people. We put engineers with marketing people. We put international people with other domestic people. And all, we, we brought in some people from outside the company to be on the teams. The more diverse that we got the team, the more diverse the thinking, and ultimately, always, won almost 100% correlation, we got better ideas. So we start, we just said we had to build it around diversity. And lastly, uh, and this, th and I'll come to this, this change required something that we could scale up across the company. Because again, the risk we worried about early on was this would be, is this the great new initiative that two years from now that if you, you hang on, it'll just go away and there'll be the next one? And it wasn't the program of the month, it was we concluded we had to change the heart of the company to make innovation part of what we do every day. And we had to make everybody, or we had to make it so everybody could come in and that we didn't have to pull people in. So that was, that was kind of the breakthrough we had you know, at the beginning of, of 2000. Uh, just conceptually, uh, this, came, this became a leadership transformation. And, and you probably talk about it, you know, we, we talk about embedment and the principles of what it takes to embed something in, in an organization. As it turns out, it looked a lot like the S-curve for a new product or developing markets or whatever. You know, our launch of this was in 1999. <clears throat> I think we kind of proved that it would work in 2003 and 4. We really scaled it up globally in two, you know, 2005 and, and 6. And right now, where we think we are, and I'll come back to this in a little bit, is we're, we're in the value creating area and we're at a sustainable, sustainable area, but because uh, people ask me when we go through the details of what we've done is, how'd you guys know all that? And the answer is, we didn't. The answer is, we, we, we figured out what it took to launch, and we figured out how to go to here. And then about every two years, <clears throat> we had made enough progress to encourage us, but as I say, we learned enough just to know what to do next. And that's kind of how we built this over time. It also takes commitment. And, and again, I, it's easy for me to, as I said, I don't want to talk about problems, I want to talk about solutions. Um, Whirlpool is committed to this state. Uh, why? There's a whole bunch of reasons, but it starts with this is where we started. This is where we grew up, and this is where we are. And there's no reason why we want to be anywhere else as long as we can be globally competitive. So today we have 4,000 full-time employees in, in, in Southwest Michigan, 900 technical people or engineers, 2,400 professional, 200 young people rotating, either new hires or international hires every year, 200 new young people turning over. Um, you know, full disclosure, I think, I mean, we have cut jobs in Michigan. We have no manufacturing today in Michigan. The, the big manufacturing left in 1986. We have more employees today with no manufacturing than we ever had when we had manufacturing. And I would say in today's salary or co compensation levels, it's pro it's pro in, in 1986 dollars, it's probably 3x for the investment in that community. Uh, we, and for a long time, get a lot of questions about, well, uh, uh, I don't know how a big global company can operate in that, that part, of it, in, in Michigan or in that small town. It is a small city. That, that's a challenge. Uh, recruiting young, single people. Some lack of diversity, spousal employment. Those are the four issues we got. Oh, and, and so, there are problems or we figure out solutions. And I will tell you, you know, year in, year out, day in, day out, we know how to overcome those challenges. Because then, but it's like anything else. You can either dwell on the negatives or you can leverage the strengths. The strengths are small town family oriented. That's pretty powerful to, to a lot of people in this world. Uh, the schools. We have two of the best school districts in the state in our part of the world. Tourism, quality of life. So the point is, as a company for us to attract great talent, which is a requirement to grow, it's a requirement to win, it's a requirement to run a global company in Southwest Michigan. We know how to manage this, and, and we do, and one of the, we, 
we work at it all the time, well, we attract great people in our part of the state. We also are engaged in the community, and, and I would say I'm sure virtually everybody in this room is. And, and I think this, this working relationship between businesses, the communities, the local governments is more critical now than certainly it's ever been in, in my career. Uh, we're investing heavily in the community. We're investing over $100 million in facilities uh, in this community. We're investing in nonprofit organizations. We're building two, we'll open this year, two new boys and girls clubs in the local community. Uh, Whirlpool people volunteer. Uh, there is not one nonprofit agency at some level of Whirlpool volunteerism. And, and when you work in the community and live in the community, you're all about wanting to make positive change for the community.